The National Security Agency's collection of Americans' phone records doesn't sit well with U.S. Representative Justin Amash. He tried last month to defund the program, calling it unconstitutional. Now Amash wants to know why the Intelligence Committee withheld information before a key vote to reauthorize the Patriot Act back in 2011. We talked with the Cascade Township Republican on West Michigan Week. And thank you for joining us on West Michigan Week on the panel. Carol Valle, Grand Rapids Business Patrick, Journal. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And Zane McMillan, MLive Media Group. How are you doing? Thanks for stopping by. Thanks. And of course, Congressman Justin Amash. Hey, Patrick. How are you? Good. You've been in the news a bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> NSA spying, this, uh, this scenario that's unfolding, this debate, is so American uh, to me. It's the battle of protecting the country's interests and protecting uh, the civil rights of Americans. That's right. uh, and, and you jump in saying you must protect the rights of its citizens. Sure, and, and our country was founded upon the belief that you can have liberty and security, and that's why we have a Fourth Amendment, which already provides the balance uh, to protect both. And uh, you, you had an amendment to mm -hmm. defund the uh, collection of the phone records. Uh, you were on the floor. Uh, this had to have been very tense. I mean, this is one of those times where the chamber is, is filled. I mean, this is a key vote. Yeah. What was it like for you being there? Well, it was a real honor, actually. Uh, it was uh, the proudest moment of uh, my time in Congress, and I, my, many of my colleagues have said the same thing, that they were very proud of that moment. Uh, we finally uh, had the opportunity to have a debate that was significant, that was important, that didn't go along uh, party lines that uh, really mattered to people back home. It wasn't naming a post office or one of these other bills that uh, comes up. It was something that was very important and affected every single person at home in a real way. And at the end of the day, we came very close on stopping the government from collecting the phone records of every single American without suspicion. And uh, I would say that yeah, when you look at uh, town halls and meetings that we've had, uh, not just me, but my colleagues, uh, most people are on our side on this issue. They think that it's wrong for the government to go after everyone's phone records without any suspicion. It was must-see C-SPAN television, especially <laughs> for journalists. We were watching that <laughs> night. Uh, and it was clearly, at least it began as a Michigan affair. And I want to yeah. uh, play some video because, as you said, this was not along party lines. And you have Mike Rogers, Republican uh, from Lansing, who uh, is the chair of the Intel Committee. And here was his argument on the floor. And I'll pledge to each one of you today and give you my word that this fall, when we do the Intel authorization bill, we will uh, work to find additional privacy protections with this program that has no emails, no phone calls, no names, and no addresses. Fourteen federal judges have said, yes, this comports with the Constitution. Eight hundred cases around uh, between the 1979 case have affirmed the underpinnings of the legality of this case. Eight hundred. So 14 judges are wrong and 800 different cases are wrong. Uh, the, the legislators uh, on both intelligence committees, Republicans and Democrats, are all wrong. Why is it that people of both parties came together and looked at this program at a time when our nation is under siege by those individuals who want to bring violence to the shores of the United States. Because those who know it best support the program because we spend as much time on this to get it right, to make sure the oversight is right. It's not a surveillance bill. It's not monitoring. It doesn't do any of those things. What happened after September 11th that we didn't know on September 10th, and again, passing this amendment takes us back to September 10th. And afterward, we said, wow, there is a seam, a gap. Somebody leading up to the September 11th attacks, a terrorist overseas called a terrorist living amongst us in the United States. And we missed it because we didn't have this capability. What if we had caught it? But the good news is we don't have to what if. It's not theoretical. Fifty-four times this and the other program stopped and thwarted terrorist attacks both here and in Europe, saving real lives. This isn't a game. This is real. It will have a real consequence. And so, I know that was lengthy. We had to edit that a little bit. But that's what it's like on the floor when you have the debate. And we'll go through the process in a minute here. But there were a couple of key items there that I, I'm sure you want to respond to. Sure. Well, Mike Rogers is wrong. 
Uh, first of all, the case that he's citing, Smith v. Maryland, isn't on point, and if it's on point at all, it's actually supportive of our position that uh, what the government is doing is uh, beyond the bounds of the Constitution. In the Smith v. Maryland case, which he talks about, and he, he talks about 800 cases that cite it, and we don't know what reasons those cases cited. They could cite it for any number of reasons. But uh, he talks about a case where there was one person who is under suspicion, already under suspicion, and the government uh, collected that person's phone records for a limited period of time during the, uh, the dr for the duration of that investigation. That is completely different from collecting the phone records of every single American on a rolling basis, permanently. That's a completely different scenario. So uh, he's, he's wrong about the case law there. And uh, the bottom line is we have a serious uh, breach of the Constitution here. When they collect metadata, they are collecting information that affects each person, that, that tracks the lives of every single person. What you is that metadata? Because we, we hear it, but do we really know what it is? Well, sure. It's, it's items like your, uh, your phone numbers, who you're calling. Um, people have said uh, it's, it's no more than what's in a phone book. Well, if that's the case, then they should just get a bunch of phone books and stop this program. Uh, but they're, uh, they're actually collecting who you're calling, the duration of your call. Uh, one of the uh, people debating on that side of the issue said uh, it's like having an Excel spreadsheet with five columns and a billion rows. Well, I don't think that makes anyone comfortable. We don't want the government having that kind of data about our lives. And I would also add that the legal theory that they're espousing, the legal theory that they're putting forward, is that if any of your data is held by a third party, it's no longer private. It becomes uh, accessible to the government without a warrant. And if you're going to follow that legal theory, then not only is your metadata available to the government, but all of the content of everything you do is available to the government. Under that legal theory, if you took a, a picture on your iPhone and it was uploaded to Apple's server in the cloud, their theory would say that the government can now access that without a warrant. Your pictures, your videos, everything. So it's a very dangerous legal theory, and it swallows up the entire Fourth Amendment. And I'm confident that if you had this case brought to the Supreme Court today, uh, and looking at the facts of, of the, this case, the facts of uh, these circumstances, they would rule that it's unconstitutional. I'm really curious in, in terms of the process. I, I, you had quite the battle to get it even, uh, the amendment introduced and, and, and then getting it to the floor for that discussion. And then you were set with all of the setup around that. Who? who has time to talk. I, I, I'm really intrigued by this process. Well, it was a very uh, difficult process. I think nobody really expected the amendment to get to the floor. Um, I, I believe that we could get it to the floor, but I had to uh, push a lot of my colleagues to, uh, to stand with me and to uh, really put the pressure on leadership. Uh, actually, the leadership team uh, decided to do something unusual because they were worried about this amendment. They worried about similar amendments. Normally, the Department of Defense Appropriations Bill, which is what we are amending, is uh, considered under an open rule. What that means is that members can go to the floor and offer their amendments. And as long as uh, their amendments are in order, they don't violate any uh, parliamentary rules, those amendments can be considered on the floor uh, for a vote. Well, for the first time, they decided to change that process and decided that the uh, House Rules Committee would essentially decide which amendments could go to the floor. So the uh, thinking was, well, they're, gonna ch they're changing the process to prevent amendments uh, like mine. I went to the Rules Committee and said, is this going to be a permanent change? Are we never going to have open rules anymore on Department of Defense appropriations? They couldn't really give good answers. At the end of the day, I think uh, Speaker Boehner uh, felt a lot of pressure from the conference, uh, the Republican conference. He had a lot of members who said, they were uh, not happy with the process, would not support the appropriations bill going forward if we didn't get some reasonable amendments on the floor, because only a few Republicans can hold up the appropriations bill um, uh, through a procedural vote. So I think he was concerned about that. And uh, at the end of the day, I do give him some credit as well for allowing it to come to the floor. Um, then I had to decide who's going to speak on the floor, because I get seven and a half minutes. Uh, each side got seven and a half minutes. And I had, I had to go to Republicans and Democrats, make sure I had them lined up in the, in the right order. And uh, of course, uh, Representative Conyers was going to be the first speaker on the other side. 
um, uh, on the Democratic side uh, in, in favor of my amendment. Uh, but then I also brought up Jim Sensenbrenner, who was the author of the Patriot Act, to speak on behalf of the amendment. And he did a fantastic job and I think persuaded a lot of people. And My goal was to bring as many Republicans and Democrats together from uh, young, old, people who have been here for many years, people who are new, and uh, try to present a, a diverse view of why this amendment is a good thing. And uh, I think it, it paid off. We, we came very close. Yeah. Do you think with that amount, uh, substantial leadership, uh, you know, from, from both Democrats and Republicans, substantial interest, you know, still uh, um, among members, do you think that it's possible to bring this back in another life? Yeah, I think uh, something like this, we won't have another amendment on the Department of Defense Appropriations Bill for right, a while. Right, specifically. But there are other amendments can, that can be brought up on an intelligence authorization bill, for example. There are other standalone bills. Uh, Rep Conyers has a bill called the Liber Liberty Act. I'm the uh, chief co-sponsor on that, so that's a really a, another joint uh, uh, piece of legislation between uh, Conyers and me. And uh, we have about 50 bipartisan co-sponsors now. It's split almost equally between Republicans and Democrats. And I'm hopeful that bills like that can go through Judiciary Committee. I think the Judiciary Committee, not the Intelligence Committee, is the appropriate place to deal with this. I, I think Seems they, a good point. I think they are more open-minded about it on the Judiciary Committee. And uh, I, that's where the Patriot Act originated. And I think that's where uh, we should have the revisions. Do you think that would happen before the end of this year, before the election cycle really swings. It should. It should. If it doesn't, I think that's a failure, a failure in leadership. Uh, people at home are very concerned about this. Uh, perhaps at first there are people in leadership on both sides, Republicans and Democrats, who took it for granted that this is not that big a deal, that nobody's really going to care that much. But I can tell you, based on my interactions with constituents, that people really do care. Not everyone at home uh, knows exactly what's going on, but those who are following what's going on and understand it are alarmed by it. And uh, I think that's something that has to be addressed. And I know that you spoke with uh, Speaker Boehner, and, mm -hmm. and I won't go into the details of that with you. I know that you don't want to. But is the issue here that it's, it's divisive, this, this topic, uh, this amendment within the party, and it shows a weakness? Is that, is that one of the issues here? Well, it, it divides both parties. And uh, there is a uh, political establishment view on this, on both the Republican side and the Democratic side, that uh, this kind of stuff is okay. And uh, even if it maybe uh, doesn't comport totally with the Constitution, or uh, if we're, we're not sure about it, but we think maybe it, maybe it does, we're just going to go forward with it and not worry about the, uh, the constitutional arguments. Um, they're too quick to rely on uh, Justice Department memos that say this is okay. They're too quick to rely on the fact that nobody's really going to know about it, so nobody's going to uh, be hurt by it. You don't, if you don't know you're being spied on, uh, uh, they think, I, I guess, that nobody's hurt by it. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a, a serious matter. It affects people. And where it's going is what's scary. Uh, it it's can start with metadata. It, c it can go on to collecting all sorts of other data, including your content. Congressman, does this um, sort of portend some uh, revisions or oversight of the Patriot Act itself? I mean, does that come into play? I yeah, mean, going sure. back to those. Sure, we have to look at revisions of the Patriot Act. And in fact, that's what the Liberty Act does. That's the, the Conyers bill. Um, it revises the Patriot Act. Th what's happened here is that the, the Patriot Act says that the government can collect information that is relevant to an investigation. And the authors of the Patriot Act, like Mr. Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin, uh, believed that relevant to an investigation meant that it actually has something to do with the person under investigation. It pertains in some uh, fairly direct way to that person. Well, what the secret courts have decided, the, the secret FISA court, uh, is that Relevant means everybody's information, because everybody in the United States is apparently relevant to an ongoing uh, terrorism investigation, uh, because you might happen to have been part of some uh, connection of calls involving some terrorist somewhere. So we're going to gather up everyone's data in the United States and, and hold it. And of course, uh, anyone who's thought about relevant in, say, a criminal context would know that this is ridiculous. 
And no, uh, no criminal prosecutor can say, we're going to just grab everyone's data in the United States because we're trying to uh, charge someone with a crime. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, more with Congressman Justin Amash in just one minute. And we're back with more West Michigan Week and U.S. Representative Justin Amash of Cascade Township. Um, I know, Zane, you want to talk about the closeness of this vote. Right. And, I, and I know, uh, Justin, you were telling us earlier that you pretty much had a good sense of who was yep. voting where. Right. And every, a lot's been made about how it was, I think it was 217 to 205. That's right. Was yeah. it? Yeah. A lot, a lot of talk was made and you felt it was success in part, uh, success in part because Democrats and Republicans came together to pass it, but a greater number came together to defeat it. Does that give you pause moving forward? Uh, do you think that could make trouble for you later? No, I don't think so. Actually, I think those who were opposed to it were surprised at the strength uh, in our numbers in favor of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, when you consider that the President of the, United of the United States, the Republican leadership, the Democratic leadership, both intelligence committees and several uh, people in the intelligence community, uh, major figures in the intelligence community, came out against the amendment and it's still almost passed. Mm -hmm. It shows you actually how strong uh, the opinion of uh, members of Congress is on, uh, on this issue because um, you know, we lost a lot of people because of the pushback from all of those others. But actually, if you, if you talk about what, actu what members of Congress actually felt, you probably had 300 or more who were in favor of the amendment. Uh, you get a lot of pushback and you're, uh, you know, you get your arm twisted on, in a lot of ways in Congress and we lost some people because of that. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel very good going forward about it. Does this um, shape then the party thought and our line in, in this regard? I mean, do the players begin to change so that there's greater debate in this, on this matter? I, I think so. Uh, or, yeah. uh, and so we'll see that going Things forward. Things are changing dramatically. If you look on the Republican side, uh, I would say if, if you look at the members who are the most conservative, uh, roughly the most conservative, the vast majority of, of those members voted yes on the amendment. Okay. 90% uh, plus of those who would be considered the most conservative members voted yes on the so amendment. So it has a domino effect it, in it's, the leadership. It's having an, an impact. And if you also look at uh, who voted on it, the people who have been there for more than five years on the Republican side voted against it pretty strongly. Those who have been there for five years or less actually voted for it. So uh, there was a majority of, of n recently elected members who were in favor of it on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. Did you know going in, because you had a sense of how many Republicans would vote for yeah. you, do you have a sense of who those undecided votes are out there? It was so close, mm -hmm. as Zane pointed out. Do you have a sense of whose minds you need to, sh to shift? It's, it's, a t it's tough to get a sense. It's such a big uh, conference. You have so many Republicans. Um, I, I tried to focus on my side. We had the Democrats, uh, some of our allies focusing on the Democratic side. Um, I knew going around that I would get almost 100 Republicans. Um, I didn't know if we'd get more, or, um, uh, but I didn't think we'd get much less. I thought we were in that range. Uh, there are people who are undecided, but obviously I can't go and speak to every single person on the House floor. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult task uh, to get that done in a short period of time. And uh, I, I would say this, of the people who I talked to who told me they're going to vote yes, every single one voted yes. And so you're nobody flipped on me. And you're still on the NSA's case right now because yeah. <laughs> you're saying that the NSA or the Intel Committee failed to reveal certain information when the Patriot Act was up for reauthorization in 2011. Yeah, that's right. And uh, we sort of uh, started to infer this uh, based on uh, a lot of uh, evidence out there first. I don't remember ever receiving uh, uh, the document that the president says we received. Uh, I talked to a lot of my colleagues. They don't remember receiving that document before the Patriot Act reauthorization vote. Then we noticed that the um, letter that was uh, written between uh, Cl uh, Director Clapper and Senator Wyden, 
uh, seemed to hint that the House um, Intelligence Committee did not provide that letter, that document, to Republican mem to the to members of the House. Um, and then we saw a white paper just last week from the administration that indicated the Senate Intelligence Committee shared that document in 2011 with senators, but it said nothing about whether the House Intelligence Committee did. Even though for the 2009 document it said both of them did. So there were a lot of clues out there. And we finally said, we're just going to ask the Intelligence Committee, did you share this with us? And they told us no. So uh, that's, a, that's a huge problem. Because as many, as many times as they can say, look, we've, um, we had briefings and you can come in and ask questions, those briefings are like a game of 20 questions. Uh, you go in there and they're not volunteering any of their secret programs. You have to guess that there is a secret program and ask exactly the right question. And if you don't ask it in the right way, they'll just say, no, it doesn't exist. And, uh, and they're not going to elaborate and they're not going to provide you any uh, information to, to clue you into what's going on. And we wonder why there's a trust issue in <laughs> there, Congress. There is, and unfortunately, unfortunately, there's a trust issue even on the Republican side between Republicans. Why, why is that? What, what, what are you saying? Well, I think there's a real fear uh, by some of the people who have been there for uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 years that there's a new wave of Republicans who are more libertarian leaning, more concerned about civil liberties issues. You can see this in the Senate with uh, people like Rand Paul and Mike Lee and Ted Cruz uh, who are beginning to sort of dominate Republican thought in that arena. And in the House it's happening as well. There's a, a good core of 20, 30, 40 people now who have a very different opinion from uh, sort of the establishment Republican thought. And it's really uh, beginning to scare those who have been there for a while. Including Karl Rove? <laughs> Including mm -hmm. Karl Rove. Because, re because recently, <laughs> because recently uh, the headline here from Huffington Post is that Karl Rove attempts to paint Justin Amash as liberal Pelosi ally. Of course, <laughs> we use the acronym LOL, laugh out loud. Uh, and here's Karl Rove's quote. He says, and why? Because he is a 100% purist libertarian. Rove continued to say, and if, he, and if it's not entirely perfect, I'm voting with... House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. You, know, you said this is not. It's ridiculous on yeah. it's ridiculous on so many levels, and actually that uh, that article you're reading points out how ridiculous it is. I thought I'd let you. But point uh, it but out. the uh, <laughs> the uh, the facts are first. I, I vote yes most of the time. Uh, you're often uh, you know you hear this pushback that people like me vote no all the time. Actually, I vote yes most of the time. Uh, compared to people who vote yes 95% of the time, yes, I vote no more often than they do, of course. But I still vote yes most of the time. The other part that's ridiculous is I vote least often with Nancy Pelosi of any member of Congress. That's like 22% of the time. Yeah, it's right? actually statistically true. Um, I actually was taking a look at the Michigan delegation to see who votes least often uh, with Nancy Pelosi. Of course, I do because I vote the least often of any anyone in Congress, but they all vote more often with Nancy Pelosi than I do. So it's, again, a, a very uh, ridiculous argument. And then the, uh, he cites the National Journal uh, for uh, their rankings of who is most conservative and who's most liberal. And the way their ranking system works is if you vote most often with leadership, you are considered most conservative. So on the Republican side, the people who are listed as most conservative are actually often those who are least conservative within the party. And those of us who are most conservative end up looking like we are more liberal on, on their scale. Now, I'm more libertarian. So we keep things the same. <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 I'm more libertarian, so I have a, a very uh, independent voting record. It's true that uh, I'll sometimes vote with Democrats on issues that uh, split from my party, but actually I still vote with my party the vast majority of the time when the two parties split. And there are times, uh, because of my views, where uh, maybe both parties are going one way and I'll be going the other way because I think that what they're doing is wrong or unconstitutional. And uh, that's an important distinction. I was just going to say not to mention some of the most ardently conservative groups in Washington give you high scores. So Yeah, <laughs> you know, funny. the same day he's calling yeah. me, um, he, he said I was the most liberal member and then the, uh, I, within 24 hours I received a, an award from FreedomWorks as their uh, defender of uh, a Freedom Award with a 100% score on their scorecard. So it's, uh, it's of course uh, totally ridiculous. But again, he represents uh, sort of that establishment Republican, uh, I'd call them sort of Washington political class fear of this new wave of Republicans who are less concerned about uh, corporatism. We don't like this idea of handing out favors to corporations. 
We're more concerned about civil liberties, and uh, we really want uh, a country that is in, in the direction of uh, freedom and liberty, free markets, and protecting people's rights. Right. Will you continue to represent in Congress, or do you think you'll make that switch into the Senate race? Well, I, I, I love representing uh, my district, and uh, I'm happy to be here, and, and for now, that's, uh, that's where I'm, I'm planning to stay. So, so no announcements this <laughs> I, have no, I have no announcements right now. Good job sneaking that one in. Good. <laughs> 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 Grand Rapids Business Journal. Thank you, Patrick. Zane McMillan, M Live Media Thank Group, you. and of course, uh, Representative U.S. Representative Justin Amash, Thanks, Republican Patrick. Cascade Township. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, and thank you for joining us this week. We'll see you next week on West Michigan Week.